All right, guys, let's have a seat. We'll get in the Word, get your Bibles out. Man, that got louder, actually, when I said that. My gosh. All right, guys. <laughs> right on. If you got a Bible, if you got a Bible, open it up to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 in the New Testament. And let's pray. Dear Father, we just come before you and we just thank you so much for your word. And we ask that right now that you would teach us through the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, teach us those things that we need to hear. And that Lord, that maybe even things that we, we don't even know we might need. And so Lord, as we let your word work, just uh, Father, move in this place. We love you, Lord. And we thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we saw in chapter 1 how uh, there were people in the church uh, way back, long time ago, people in the church that were, um, they professed to know God, but they denied him. Isn't that horrible when someone is in the church and they don't know the Lord? And, but it, it's not just that they don't know, we want people in the church that don't know the Lord. It's an open door policy. Come on in so you can learn about the Lord, that you could receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. But these guys were liars. They were in there to harm the church. And it says in verse 16 of the previous chapter, it says that they were abominable, disobedient, disqualified for every good work. These guys were there to do damage in the church. How horrible is that? And Paul was encouraging Titus, this young pastor on the island of Crete, hey, this is how you handle them. And, he, and remember what the, uh, he tells him to do? Uh, take him out back and beat him up. No, not at all. <laughs> does not say that. Paul tells Titus, this young pastor, teach him the word. Tell him what's up. Speak to them. Exhort them. And we'll, we'll again look at this word exhort. Exhorting and what it means. And, uh, and it means encouragement. We'll, we'll get into that today. But then he con contrasts. That, you know, chapter 2 is a pivot point. Where he says, okay, that's how they are. They're pretty bad guys. This is how you're supposed to handle them. But now this is how you handle yourself, Titus. This is, Pastor, remember, this is the, the pastoral epistles. These are the letters that Paul wrote to Titus and to Timothy about how they need to be pastors. And, and it's, it's important that they have good conduct as pastors. And so he's telling Titus, this is how you handle yourself and how you handle other people in the church. And so he says in verse 1, he goes, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. As for you, Titus, this is for you. Uh, don't be like them. Those crazy people that are causing damage in the church, you don't do that. Paul is telling young Titus. Uh, like a father talking to a son. Titus, don't go there. And so he says, Titus, when you go there, this is, how, this is what you do. Those guys were disqualified of every good work, abominable, uh, disobedient. Don't be like those, those guys. You, on the other hand, this is how you treat the people in the body of Christ. And so he's given, he's telling, and he breaks it down to really five groups of people in the body of Christ. And every church has them. And these five groups of people, Paul tells Titus, Titus, this is how you handle these five core groups in your church in the body of Christ, on the island of, Ty uh, of the island of Crete, this is how you handle them. And, uh, and it's really cool. It's bro broken up into five groups. The older men, the older women, the younger women, the younger men, and bond servants, which are slaves. You're like going, are there slaves in this church? No, they're, they're, it's different now. We are a different culture, and we'll get to that when we get to it. But it says here, so this is Paul's advice to Titus on how to reach these five groups. And he says, how you get to them is that you have to speak things fitting or proper for sound doctrine. That means it, it, it just, it's teach them the Bible. The major job, one of the major jobs of a pastor is to teach the Bible. Because through that, guys, the Lord ministers. When a pastor teaches you the word, we give you the word. This is what it means. This is what it says. Like it says in the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. 
They spoke the word, and then they gave the sense of it. This is what it means. And, and that's what you do. And then you let the word do the work in the body, in the body of Christ, in the church, and with you guys, with all of us. When you talk in or out of the pulpit, and this is the cool thing, when he says, speak to things that are fitting for sound doctrine, in the Greek there, in the, in the Bible, he also is talking about, let your life be fitting with what you're saying. Let it be fitting or in line with what you teach. And pastors, and this is the deal, guys, pastors, the worst thing a pastor could be is a hypocrite. Nothing is worse than that. I hope, that, I hope that I would never become that. If I ever become a hypocrite, please change churches. All right, get out of here. Find a body that does not have a hypocrite for a pastor. There's nothing more damaging than a hypocrite pastor. It will have the hypocrisy that pastors have. Oh, and, and you know what? It, pastors need, this is the deal. Pastors need to let their Saturdays line up with their Sundays. It just has to happen. It is like what you preach from the pulpit, you got to live out, Pastor. That's my rule. That's how it is. Now, am I a failed human being? Heck yeah. <laughs> will I mess up? Probably. But I will tell you one thing there's grace for the pastor, and there's grace for you guys, too. There's grace for all of us. Nothing is more dangerous, uh, damaging, dangerous. Um, but Titus says, deal with these things through the word. T teach him these things. And so the first group that he is encouraged to deal with is the older men. Look at verse 2. It says that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. So he's talking to the older men. Now, what, now you're like going, all right, what's an older man? What's an older man? Now, does the Bible tell us this, Andrew? Well, Greek culture does. It, uh, Greek literature does. If you read the histories of what an older man is, older men get that moniker around 50 to 60 years old. That's the window time, 50 to 60. So if you're 50, who, uh, gentlemen, who's 50 and 60 and up? 50 and 60 up. Break, okay, these are your older men in the church. Look at them. <laughs> Raise your hand. I saw some of you put them down. Put them up. Look around. These are the older men, okay? Now, I will not do this with the older women. I, will, I won't do that because I want to I wanna live. I want to go eat chili. But guys, older men, 50 to 60 and up, okay? It's like, and I, I'm not there yet. So, uh, uh, so 46, right on, you know? Everybody's like, you're 46, you look like you're 70. You know, they're like, isn't that hilarious? So, but uh, <laughs> older men, 50, 60, okay? That's when you start to get that, you cross over. Uh, and so, but you guys are, the, what, how are we, what, so Titus is supposed to, it, Paul tells Titus, and Titus, you encourage the older men to be sober. Now, when we think of sober, we all, it's like, don't get drunk. Uh, it, it does mean that. That's how it's used. But it's also used as in the sense of having common sense, good judgment, an absence of foolishness. Uh, but a lot of people believe that soberness in a uh, person is like, <gasps> you know, we cannot laugh. Uh, we have to be totally serious about every situation. Uh, are you laughing? Excuse me. You're in sin. No. Are, are, you, are you having... A, a lovely day today. Excuse me. The Bible says to be sober. That means to be no sober doesn't mean to be a, a jerk or a uh, sober doesn't mean to be so stringent that you forget joy. It means to be serious. It means to be serious about things. And what is the Bible all about? Well, the Bible is all about love and joy and peace and patience and righteousness and holiness. It's it's about uh, obedience. The Bible has a whole bunch of stuff that it's about, and we need to be sober about those things, serious about those things. So just like we're serious about holiness, I want to live a holy life. I want something that lines up with God's word, amen? I want to be holy, but also I want to be serious about love. I want to be serious about joy. Uh, the Bible talks about how th the Lord gives us happiness. I want to be serious about happiness. I want to be, I want to be a seriously happy person. 
I want to be a seriously joyful person. That's sober. That's, what, that's what the whole idea of sober. So when we think of sober, it's not stringent. You know, it, it's, it, the Bible talks about being caring and kind. Be serious about those things. I'm going to be dead serious about being kind to people and loving people. You understand that, guys? So when he says sober, that's what the older men are supposed to be. It's not like when you hit 60 or 50, you go, all right, no more happiness. No, just serious about the good things of God. Praise the Lord. Then it says reverence. It means respectable. Uh, it just, it's, a, it's, a, it's a respectable thing. Be respectable. Don't play a fool. You know, just be respectable. Temperate is self-control. Have yourself under self-control. And then it says sound in faith, sound in love, and sound in patience. The word sound means healthy, not mixed in, not poisoned or polluted. It is a, it's something that's straight. It's something that's not, uh, something that's not tainted with. Um, we're supposed to have a healthy, not mixed, not compromised, not polluted patience in God as an older man. Older men need to be, have that healthy, not mixed, not polluted love of God. The older men are supposed to uh, have that healthy faith in God, which is the, the whole counsel of God, the whole, the, just the Christian faith. I, I love this. You know, patience means remaining steadfast in trials in a way that honors God. Now, as, now, this is the deal. This is what Titus is instructed to teach the older men. And as pastors, all pastors, we're supposed to encourage this through the teaching of God's word that that happens with the older men in our church, even with Calvary Chapel Long Beach. This is how it's supposed to be. So if you're an older man, these are the things that we pray that you have in your life. A soberness, a reverence, a self-control, sound in doctrine, sound in love, sound in patience. Now, you may be an older man here today and go, how in the heck can I get that? I want that, but uh, have I, have, I want, how do I get it? Well, look what it says. It says, be, be sober. That's holiness. Start practicing holiness in your life. He, uh, reverence is a humility. You, a, a, a true respectableness is humility. The Bible talks about that, how reverence and respectability comes from humbling yourself and being a servant of all. It's through humility. It's through, you want the self-controlled life? How can I be self-controlled? The Bible says that it's a fruit of the Spirit. Be Spirit-filled. Be walking in the Spirit. And you want to be sound in faith, love, and patience? Well, if you want to be healthy, sound in those things, older men, guys, don't compromise in your life. Stick with the things of the Lord. And this happens through experience. I'll tell you one thing. There's nothing better than an older man who loves the Lord and is seasoned, a seasoned saint of a man. I'll tell you, they're fathers in the faith. I thank God that there's a lot of those here. Praise God. Back in Kentucky, there's a, my, my, uh, my wife's uncle is named Don. We call him Uncle Don, who's married to, you know, my, my mother-in-law's sister named Aunt B. We have a real Aunt B in the family. <laughs> Very cool. And with that said, Uncle Don, he's up there, man. And, I, and he's a, talk about a seasoned saint, farmer, just great guy, just a, a blessing. And I remember him walking in one day, and every chance I get, I would love to just sit and talk with him. And I was sitting there, and man, I was, I, and I'm just blown away just by this man of God. Just loves the Lord. My father-in-law is the same way, just a man of God. Just loves the Lord. Just soaks it in and just tells you about Jesus all the time. Comes back to the Lord. And you guys do the same thing when we have men's fellowships and you guys come over. There's nothing better than the older men who love the Lord. It's just so great. And I tell you, so it's a beautiful thing. Now, now verse 3, the older women. Uh-oh. Yeah, hold on, guys. Listen. The older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. That they admonish the younger women, and then they admonish the younger women. They, they, they encourage the younger women. 
Now an older woman, same age group, 50 to 60 is the transfer, and you become that older woman. I will not have a show of hands, but this is the thing. You know who you are. And God bless you. Reverent in behavior. That word in the Greek is not wild. Don't, don't be wild. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll just shut up. But yeah, don't be wild. I was going to say, don't be cougars. You know, just, just chill. <laughs> but, and, uh, but those older women in the faith, in the church, it's like, hey, be reverent in behavior. Uh, don't, don't get crazy, you know? Uh, and he's tell, he says, encourage them not to be that way. Not slanderers. The word in the Greek there is diabolos. It means where we get the word devil. Uh, it, it's a liar. De devil means he's a liar. That's how Satan is. Uh, it's those harmful gossips. And he says, don't let them be, be devils in the church. Let, watch your mouth in the church. Be careful of that. And that goes for everybody. And then he's not given to much wine. Don't, you know, don't get drunk. Don't, be a, a, don't go there. Uh, teachers are good. Remember, for, you can have the liberty to drink alcohol, but you're, the Bible calls us Christians not to get, we're not supposed to be drunkards. We're not supposed to be drunk. Teachers of good things, a source of encouragement. It's God's calling for the older women to encourage the younger women in the body of Christ. It's, it's re respectable actions, truthful talk, sober-minded because that's the word that's used there with older women, reverent. It's, it's the same thing, sober. It makes encouragement so much easier when you live that way. And how can you ladies get there? Maybe some of you ladies are going, how, how can I get there? Well, it, remember, it says here, reverent in behavior. Just submit yourself to Jesus. Holiness. When, when you're verbally encouraging the younger people, ladies, older ladies, when that's in, happening, when you're encouraging, you're not going to have time to talk smack about anybody else <laughs> because you're encouraging someone else. And boy, is that a lesson for all of us. Man, how much, more, how much, how much time do I have in encouraging others? And if I encourage somebody else... I'm not going to be talking maliciously about someone else because I'm encouraging someone in the faith and spirit-filledness. Back in the book of Luke, there's a wonderful story. Jesus has is, is just been born. He's going into the temple to be circumcised, dedicated. And in Luke chapter 2, verse 36, it says, There was one, her name was Anna, and she was a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. I love that. Asher means happy. It's, it was her family name. And she was a great age. And so she's very old. Anytime the Bible anytime mentions a person's age, saying that they're a great age, they were up there. And, and she had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years. So she was very, uh, she was in her 90s probably. Who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. Did you catch what she was doing? Here is a woman, an older saint in the faith. And this woman was, she did not depart from the temple. She just wanted to be with Jesus constantly. She just wanted to be with God constantly. She just wanted to be in the presence of God. And she was there. And what happens in the temple? You, you know what happens in the temple? Praying. You prayed in the temple. The temple was a place of prayer. But serve God. She served God. How did she serve God? With fastings and prayers, night and day. So she was a prayer warrior. She was a person who prayed. I'll tell you, there's nothing. There's something special about those godly older men. But there's something very essential for older women in the church to be prayers. It is uh, one of the most important things a church needs. And well, everybody needs to pray, but there's something special about the older women. Praying for everyone. Because they know how to pray. Those seasoned saints. Those people in the body of Christ that know how to do it. I'll, I'll never forget Eileen Ganap. She's with the Lord. She, she, she prayed for it. There are many people around here right now 
that are a result of her answered prayers. It's just a glorious thing. And I'll tell you, guys, be prayers. You older ladies, be praying. And notice what she says. And coming in in that instant. So she came in, saw Jesus, the baby Jesus there. And because she hung out with God, she knew the Son of God. Coming in that instant, she gave thanks to God and spoke of Jesus to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. She was an evangelist. I'll tell you, some people say, oh, you know, I'm an older lady. I'm going to just hang it up. I'm, I'm done. I'm not doing anything. Oh, you just begun. She did not stop in telling people about the Lord. I love that. And that's what she did. She spoke of Jesus. Evangelized the temple. And then in verse 4 of Titus 2, and it says, and, the, um, and what did the older woman do? It is to encourage and they admonish the young women to love their husbands. The job of the older women is to, some people think admonish means to teach. And I'm going to teach, I'm going to tell these young women how to do it. And what is a young woman? It's anyone who is below that 50, 60 mark below. Okay, so that's a young woman. That's who it is. They are usually wives and mothers, culturally speaking, in this book. Because back in the day, everyone got married, mostly everybody, and this is for wives and mothers. But you guys, and this thing, older women are to encourage, build up, scoop up these younger women, older ladies who love Jesus, and just love on them. We need that. And it happens within the body of Christ. But you younger women, and this is what Titus is encouraged to do with them, he says, admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may, be blas uh, may not be blasphemed. Love their husbands, Love their children. This goes back to Ephesians chapter 5. A wife is to love her husband. We're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Ephesians 5 says the husband is to love his wife like Christ loves the church. Absolutely. But here it says, wives, love your husbands. And then the hardest one of all, love your kids. <laughs> That's tough, you know? Young women, moms, wives, hey, love your children. Love your husbands. I, yeah, you're like, well, I think loving the husband is going to be harder, Andrew. <laughs> We're perfect. No, I'm just joking. No, no. <laughs> you're like, no, you're not. Just love. There is something that's so important about a, a wife or a mom loving, a loving mom, a loving wife. And the Bible encourages that. And he says, older women encourage them to love their family. And then he uses the word, this, the young women are supposed to be discreet. That word is sober. I don't even know why they use the word discreet here in the English. It's the word sober that's used in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 8, chapter 2, verse 2, chapter 2, verse 12, chapter 2, verse 6. It's sober. So if you want to just put on the margin of your Bible, sober, that's what discreet means. It's just serious about the things of God. Just be serious about the love, the serious about the joy, serious about the holiness. And then they use the word chaste, which means pure. It's a modesty. That was a thing back in the day. There was people back in the day who dressed in a way that provoked uh, a, a, an image. You know, and there is a, a certain modesty that needs to happen within the body of Christ. A purity, a modesty. First Peter chapter 3, verse 3 through 6 addresses that. And back in Paul's days... This is how crazy it was. The women in the church were dressing up like the temple prostitutes. And it was a cultural thing. That was a thing that was done in the pagan circles. And it was coming into the church. And Paul says, hey, guys, let's not do that. Because it was quite evident. You know? And so as you mature in your faith, there's a certain change that occurs. You know, I want to be more like Jesus and less like the world. And so that's what Paul was addressing here. And he goes, hey, ladies, just remain chaste. He doesn't go off. I love it. He doesn't go off on it. 
He says, you know what's up. Just be, just be, hey, pure and modest. And then he tells these women who are married, be homemakers. Uh, th these people got married around 15 years old. All right, so, whew, you know, having a 16-year-old in the house is kind of a 16-year-old daughter. I'm like, geez, Louise. Uh, that, but, uh, um, you know, I was thinking about my grandmother who got married at 15, you know, back in Oklahoma. That's just gnarly, you know. And my, my, my parents, and Kelly's parents, uh, got married at 18. Uh, I think my mother-in-law was 18. And I think, uh, Drex, you were, you were 21, right? I, I want to talk about that. My father-in-law's here today. But, but it is like, you know, that's just amazing, you know. But they got married so early. Now things have changed culturally where they, have, they wait until later. But here are the wives who he's talking to as the young women. Just be homemakers. Make sure that your house is cooking, that the house is moving, that everything's in order. You're like, well, doesn't the husband have responsibility in this? Yes. But guys, remember, so often... <laughs> the ladies, you know, it says in the Bible that the husband is supposed to be the leader, which he, he is. He's submitted to Jesus, and then he's the leader of the household. But this is the crazy thing. Often in the house, you know, if you ask any kid in the house, who's the boss of the house? It's the mom. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, you know, yeah, the husband, the dad is the leader. But yet, listen, the wife she runs things. She, you know, he's the head, but she's the neck that turns the head, you know? And it's just how it is. And I'll tell you, praise the Lord for godly wives that take care of everything. I know if it wasn't for Kelly, it would be bad <laughs> in our house. I thank God for my wife. And, you know, and this is the thing. As a husband, it says that I'm supposed to love my wife like Christ loves the church. And, and what, what did it happen? That Jesus gave himself to the church, died for the church. Therefore, it's my job as a husband to assist, love, take care, make things. You know, don't, be, don't just sit on the couch like a bump on the log and a couch potato. We're called to help, assist, love, care, provide. That's the job of the husband. And as the, as the wife, hey, take care of everything. But yet the husband is also supposed to love his wife. And then the wife is supposed to yield to her husband. We'll talk about that in a second. It says here that a young woman is supposed to be good, kind. Same thing. And it also says here that um, um, obedient to their own husbands. That's submission. That's what it talks about in Ephesians chapter 5, the marriage chapter. When it says that a wife should submit to her husband. Oh, that, uh, people freak out. People, I, it's true. And you know what, ladies, I don't blame you. You know, uh, submit, what? What is that? Am I a doormat? No, not at all. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. In Ephesians chapter 5, the wife is to submit to her husband. That means that she's not a slave. She's not to be oppressed. Submission is, it's the job of the wife to let the husband lead. Dude, husband, bro, you go. And I'll follow. And sometimes that's scary. But that's what the Bible says to do. And then in so doing, Ephesians 5 says, the husband then loves his wife as Christ loves the church. And this is the great thing about marriage. This is really the secret to marriage. If a husband is loving his wife like Christ loves the church, if he's loving his wife like he's supposed to be, she will have no problem letting him lead. And it, ladies, wives, if you are le letting your husband lead, he's going to be more apt to love on you. And so you get this wonderful little cycle going of submission and love, love and submission. And then the Bible says, husbands and wives, both of you guys, guys submit to each other. It says that as well in Ephesians 5. And then it says here in Titus that the husbands love the wives and the wives love the husbands. So it's this wonderful thing of love and submission that's going on. And how great is that? Is not that marriage? That's biblical marriage. It's really the key to marriage, what the Bible says. And that is what's supposed to be happening. And he gives the reason why in verse 5, it says that the husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. The word of God lays this out and he says this needs to happen so that the word of God is not um, dishonored. 
You know, the divorce rates in the church are the same as they are outside the church. There's no difference. And that's a problem. And guys, that's why when people look at the word and they, this, the word of God says, hey, this is the way. This is how marriage should go as a Christian family. Well, guess what? So often it's not, and it's a dishonoring thing into the word. Marriages reflect the word of God and what the word does and what Jesus has done in the life. It's an illustration to the world of how God, how Jesus loves the church and how the church should love Jesus. And when a Christian marriage breaks up, that illustration to the world is broken. And that's why it's dishonoring to the word. So how can you ladies do this? Well, what about the single ladies? What about all those, the, the, the women that don't have husbands? This doesn't apply to me. Oh, yeah, it does. Same thing. You younger women love the Lord. Love your man. Who's my man? I'm a single person. No, Jesus is your man. Love the Lord. And then what does the Bible say? Love others. Love the Lord with all your hearts and love others as yourself. Just love. Be sober, you single ladies. Be pure and modest and holy. And guys, be kind. You can't be a homemaker because you don't have a home, a, a family of your own, but you do have a, the ability to be kind. And you submit and yield, not to your own husband, because you single ladies do not have husbands yet, but you submit and yield to your man. Who's your man? Jesus. So yeah, this is for the single ladies as well. And how can the ladies achieve this in your life? The wives and moms that are here today, how can you get that? It's through having those godly encouragers from the older women, those godly examples. Have godly examples in your life. That's why church is so important. Because you get to hang out with other people who are Christians who have lived longer than you. And you see those older women, and you see what they went through. I'll tell you, it's an encouragement. Obey God's word and yield to Jesus and love the Lord. And in verse 6, it says this. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded. Done. That's it. You're like, you mean young men? Anyone who is under 50, those 40s, 30s, and younger, who are they? Raise your hand. I can make you raise your hand. Who's 40s, 30s, younger men? All right. There you are. Guess what, guys? You liar. But uh, no, no, <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I'm just kidding. You know, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just picking on somebody. But you younger men, he uses the word exhort. Exhort the young men. The word exhort kind of sounds harsh. I'm going to exhort you. What does that mean? Exhorting is a gentle and kind and loving begging. I'm begging you kindly. I'm begging you lovingly. Young men, what's their call? What's the one thing he says here? Now, Paul tells Timothy to t teach way more things. Titus, the young men only get one thing. Be sober-minded. Be sober. There's that word again, sober. Sound mind, common sense. Sometimes when you look at young men, you, you think, they're stupid. <laughs> I, what is wrong with that guy? Sometimes you just look at it and you're like going, you know, good grief. You know, there's some problems with that younger man. But we're, oh, younger men are supposed to be sober, which means sound mind, right mind. How do you get that? How does a young man get a good mind? Well, the Bible has a lot to say about that. And we won't get into it all today because of time, but how do you get a mind for God? Philippians 4.8. Uh, young men, turn there real quick. Everybody, really. If you know a young man, share this with them. Philippians 4.8 says this. It says, finally, brother, and whatever, and this is for everybody, not just the young men, but this is how you get your mind on God. It says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are a good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, 
Think on those things. Think about those things that are pure, lovely, uh, uh, just, and noble. That's what we're supposed to be doing. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says that, that we should take every thought into captivity under the honor or the glory of Christ. Into the, I'm sorry, into the submission of Jesus Christ. We need to take, have you ever had those weird thoughts? And you're like going, my goodness, where did this sinful thought come from? Oh my goodness. Where does it, where, and this thought pops in your brain. The Bible says take every thought, every wor- or maybe it's a worry or a fear or a, something that's freaking you out. And you got that thought in your brain. The Bible says take that thought and say, Lord, I'm giving it to you. I'm putting it into submission of you. Capture every thought that's weird. And then Romans 12, 1 through 2, talks about the renewing of the mind. Well, I, oh, I got to read it. It's too good. Romans, just tw- Romans 12. Romans 12, it says, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And, do, and the, well, here it is. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Don't, don't, don't be like this world. Christians are God, we got, we're called to be transformed, to change. How? By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Get your mind renewed. And that happens with the word. Remember what it says in Psalms. How can a young man cleanse his way by obeying or taking heed to the word of God? Wow, that's it. That's how a a stupid young man can become a sober young man. How? By simply obeying and submitting his brain to God and his word. That's it. In verse 7 through 8, the attention is turned not from old men, older, uh, older men, older women, younger women, younger men. He then turns to Titus. Says, okay, Titus, you're up. So this is for the pastor. I'm gonna raise, I had you guys raise your hand. I'm gonna raise my hand now. Seven and eights for me. In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be uh, condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, have nothing evil to say to you. So the pastor's charge is that in all things, you're supposed to be an example. I'm supposed to be an example. Your pastors, pastors are supposed to be an example. And boy, I'll tell you, there are so often pastors are not. They fleece the flock. They, they, oh, it's horrible. I, there's this, oh, I but it just, it's just gnarly. It just gets me frustrated when I see people who are pastors and they're wearing sweaters that are $2,000. Just kicks my, it just, it, it butters my biscuit. It really gets me, t- just, it just, it, there's a little, I get a little twitch in my eyes. Just like, oh. When I think about it, it really bothers me. Live a, pastors are called to live a normal life. We're supposed to be normal. That's it. Just live a normal life. You know, we're not called to, it's just, it's just insane. And it just, uh, it, it was, we're called to be good examples in word and in deed. And there are so many pastors, they, they'll preach on Sunday and they'll live like the devil through the rest of the week. And boy, it, it just, be an example, pastors. Titus, Paul is telling them, be an example. Integrity. That means purity in your doctrinal teaching. Have integrity when you teach the scriptures, pastors. He says also, pastors are to have reverence, a seriousness with and in the things of the Lord. We talked about that already. Sound speech means healthy conversations. And Titus is telling, uh, sorry, Paul is telling Titus this to protect the pastor. If when we, this is not, and remember, when he's talking to the older men, the older women, the younger women and the younger men and the pastors, 
He is doing this for our protection. This protects us. This protects us. It, it, it's not rules and regulations to say, all right, this is how, do, 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 do. this is for our protection. I'm glad this is here for me as a pastor because now I know how to do it the proper way. I know how to live and do my ministry the way God wants me to do it. Amen? And so too with you, being an older, seasoned saint, a younger saint in training, growing in Christ. These are for our learning and for our protection. And how can a pastor do this? Is by following Jesus' example. And then the last two verses, and this is where we're going to end today. Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things. Not answering back, not pilfering, not showing all good, and showing good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Now, bond servants are slaves. That's the word that's used here. We don't have slaves here. The closest thing that we have to this, what the Bible talks about, is employment, is working a job. You're like, that's right, Andrew. It is slavery. <laughs> it is. The nine to five, the grind. Oh, it's slavery. It feels like that sometimes. I don't blame you. But this is the thing. As an employee, we are we are, we're working for somebody just like a slave does back in the day. So this is for us. If you got a job, he, he, and it's a Christian employee underneath someone else's authority on a job, this is how we're called to be. And it says obey. Obey. Now remember, Paul puts a caveat on that. He says obey unless your master is telling you to do something that's against against the, 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 the word of God. He says, obey God rather than man, the Bible says. Obey God. So, but we're called to be obedient. So when the boss says, hey, I need you to go and check this thing over here. And you go, sorry, I don't think the Lord wants me to do that today. No, no, you just check the specs on the giga, whatever, you know? Do that, do that. It doesn't mean, you know, this is, hey, obey your bosses. If he tells you to sweep, you sweep. If he tells you to do this, you do this. And he says, well-pleasing. Do it in such a way that it pleases your boss. Be, do it well. You know, so often when we do it, we're just like, are you happy? Am I well-pleasing to you? Am I well-pleasing? No. Guys, let me tell you, it's, that you're doing it in a way that you're like, I just want to put a smile on my boss's face. Don't talk back. That's the next thing. Don't talk back. You know? Hey, I want you to do this thing for me. Oh. Whoa. Don't do that. Don't steal. Don't steal. Be careful. And that's even time. Don't steal your time. You're on, on the clock. <laughs> there, was a, there was a plumber in the neighborhood, you know who it is, I won't say, does not go to our church. But they were Christian, and we hired them. And they came to our office, when we had an office, and they were doing the job, and this guy, he was, he was the boss of the company, and he was just doing this job, and, and then he started talking to the Lord, and we had coffee there, we had coffee, and he, and he got the toilet fixed, and he's just talking away. He was there for an, an hour, almost two hours. Most of it was conversation, and, and it was a great time. We got the bill. He charged us for the coffee. I'll never forget that as long as I live. I, I, I was like, and my dad was the pastor at the time. I'm like, Dad, we were talking the whole time. He was like, and he, and he charged us for the conversation? I'll never forget that. And he stole time. And so what we did, no, I'm just joking. No, we didn't do anything. We just, we actually paid it, you know? So, but don't be that way. Don't steal of money, finances, stuff, time. Don't steal. And it says in all fidelity. That means be loyal to your employer. Wow. So, so different from the world, huh? But that's what Christian employees are supposed to be like. And what's, look, and this is the thing that's so special. Look at verse 10. It says, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. That we, you, you take... Now, why are we doing this? Because the Bible tells us to do it. 
the Bible tells us and teaches us to do. God tells us through his word to do these things. And it says that we adorn ourselves with this doctrine. Isn't that gnarly? Adorn means to put on. It's actually to put on fancy clothing. What does that mean? The doctrine of God needs to be like clothing upon us. You know, when you get a job, you got to wear a uniform, right? Sometimes. You wear a uniform. You know, I, as a Calvary Chapel pastor, my uniform is Hawaiian shirts and jeans and, and shorts, flip-flops. Thank God. No. Uh, but, you know, but as a pastor, sometimes you got to wear a uniform. And what is that? A doggone suit and tie. And when I do a wedding, i got to wear a suit and tie. And you know me. I hate suit and ties. But I'll do it because I love you. And I'm, you expect it from a pastor. To, if you're going to get married, you've got to wear a suit and tie. If you're going to bury someone, marry and bury. Marry and bury. you got to suit up. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Greg, <laughs> suit up. You know? Oh, you know? I remember I was talking to my dad one time. He says, don't bury me in a suit. But I was like, I was like all right. It was a long time ago. We're way before he passed away. He goes, don't bury me in a suit. I remember saying, let's, not, let, let's get some shorts or something like that. You know, let's make them casual. You know, and it's like, don't do it. Don't do it. But this is the thing. You got to wear a uniform sometime. I feel bad when I go. It's, it's amazing. You go, you go to Cerritos Mall, and there's a li- lovely little place called Hot Dog on a Stick. Have you seen those outfits? God bless them. God bless them. And you got to wear it, man. Those ladies, those guys, they look weird, you know? But it's, it's hot dog on a stick tradition. Amen? And you know what? I wouldn't want to eat at that place if they didn't wear those outfits, you know? It's just something when they churn the, 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 the lemonade and they give you their corn dog that you're like, thank you, weird dressed person. God bless you. But this is the thing, guys, when you look at those outfits, as a Christian employee, you're supposed to adorn yourself with these things that are taught in God's word. Wow. Loyalty, honesty, well-pleasing. I'll tell you, guys, if you're working a job, if you're an employee, your job is a ginormous mission field. And don't be ashamed of who you are as a Christian. Let people know. Let it flaunt it. Everybody else flaunts everything else at their job. It's your right. It's like, I'm a born-again Christian. Let people know. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, why do Christians always have to be intimidated and say, Oh, that's why I, uh, I, I can't talk about it. How can we do this, Christian employees? Be obedient to the Lord. He calls you to be obedient. First, if you're you're obedient to the Lord, you're going to be obedient to your boss. Please the Lord. If you please the Lord, guess what you're going to do? You're going to please your boss because you're going to get used to it. Prayer. It says here, don't talk back. But if you're in a situation where you want to talk back, when you got a little smack, when you got a little side eye, Pray. Pray. Turn that into, instead of talking smack, talk to the Lord. Say, God, I'm just praying for a boss right now. Pray for your boss. Pray for those fellow employees that you don't like. And then loyalty. Just, hey, instead of stealing, just give to the Lord. Give to the Lord, give to the Lord your time. And when you're a giver, you won't, you won't be a stealer in life. So, guys, this is the body of Christ. What we just covered, and we'll stop right there. This is the body of Christ. Minister, serve, bless each other. We're called to love one another. Prayer, encourage, fellowship, care. The Bible says if one hurts, we all hurt. If one is stoked, we're all stoked. That's the joy of the body of Christ. It's the, it's the church. And we here at Calvary Chapel Long Beach, it, this is healthy. But, uh, Joe calls it body ministry. Remember him talking about that body ministry. Notice, a lot of people think it's the job of the pastor to care for the church. It is. But also it's the job of the body to care for each other. And that is some sweet stuff right there. And you know what? I'm going to boast in the Lord about you. I praise God that he's done that here in a strong, stinking way. 
There are times when people are in pain here and the church just rises up and just comforts the, the body of Christ. It's like when you smack, you know, the Bible calls the church the body, right? And we all have different members, like it says in Ephesians. Each one has a, a part in the body of Christ and Jesus is the head. There have been many times when people in the body have been hurt and another part of the body comes to comfort that. That's why we have church. That's why we have this. And the Bible says, hey, come together and minister. How sweet is that? How can you minister if you're, if you're not together? Spirit-filled life. Jesus is the head. The whole body in submission to Jesus Christ, including me, everybody. It's all about the Lord. So guys, that's the healthy body. You're like, and, and then just check your heart. You know, look, go back tonight and reread through these things and say, Lord, you work this work in my heart. You do this in my heart because this thing, it's not a thing where you're going to get up in the morning and say, okay, I'm going to be a great young man, God-fearing Christian. Let's do this. Me, oh, there's a part of it. It's a choice. Oh, I'm going to do this right now. I'm going to be this godly older woman. I'm going to be this godly older man. Here we go. And then, and you, and you, you, this is a work that the Lord does in your heart. If you think I'm going to doctor fill this, or I'm going to Oprah this sucker, or I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get 12 step it. It's yielding, submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, just come into my heart and just do the work. And then when you and spend time with Jesus, remember, godliness comes from being with God. When you're in his presence, you start to become like him. You surround yourself with the things of God, you're going to start acting the way he wants us to act. Amen? So guys, with all that said... I just encourage you to bless the Lord and bless others. And you will not regret it one bit. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for this day. We ask that you would just go before us. And Father, we ask that you would just uh, help us, Lord, to be those things that you called us to be in the body. Lord, I looked up the older men that you bless those guys. But Lord, be with the older women, the widows in the church also. For the younger women, the mothers, the young mothers, the, 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 the younger moms, the younger wives, and the single ladies, Lord, bless them. And the younger men, Lord, let there be soberness, seriousness about the things of God in this place. We love you, Jesus. Help us to be a good witness for you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. Well, have a great rest of the week. If you would like to join in on the festivities outside, please do. Um, listen to who's ever out there handing out those little uh, ballots. Have fun. God bless you. But this week, just submit yourself to Jesus Christ, okay? Have a great week. Remember that Jesus loves you and I love you too. Got that? All right, let's worship the Lord. Tyler.